Alright, so we are back to stock market. We begin with the stock market. First we do, uh, remember this course is kind of like all financial markets and institution. We begin first with the financial instruments. And the financial instruments we cover, section one was Common stock and section two, or kind of like what they have a goal to, will be preferred stock. Now we go through the next section is financial markets. And financial markets here for the stock market, like for any other financial market, we divide into, uh, okay, let's write it as section three, primary. And number four, secondary. So, now we focus on the primary. So the section now becomes primary. Stock market is financial market where corporations raise capital by issuing stock. Corporation raise capital by issuing stock. So in the primary stock market, the corporation is the issuer. On the other end, issuer receives the cash. On the other end, you have investors and in between them, you have investment bank. Basically, this section is about how investment banking works in the stock market. We covered a little bit of how investment banking works in the bond market. So, just as before, in exactly the same legal and financial terms, an investment bank will, we say, underwrite, underwrite underwriting is the process of assuming responsibility in this case for issuing the stock and if in bonds case for the responsibility for issuing a bond so in generally is the responsibility to issue a security. That's the underwriting. And the underwriting goes in, oh, for some of you, maybe was it on the quiz or the midterm? Best efforts. And the other one will be. Firm commitment. In a firm commitment, the underwriter 
that's the investment bank would be acting as the underwriter will guarantee a fixed price and a fixed quantity of shares to the issuing corporation to the issuer and if they receive less they will take a loss and if they receive more they will take a profit okay next on best of oh, sorry on firm commitment is the following the next thing within firm commitment uh, okay right here the camera a little bit go this way will be net proceeds net proceeds Proceeds generally means amount of money received for something. Proceeds maybe you sell stock and you get some proceeds. That's the cash you get. Or you sell a house, the money they pay you is the proceeds. So net proceeds is the amount of money which the investment bank pays to the issuing corporation. So, proceeds will mean the amount of money that the issuing corporation will receive from the investment bank. That's the net proceeds. Then you have the gross proceeds. is the amount of money that the investment bank receives from investors. Uh, let's try to do the boxes over here. It goes like this. This is the investment bank. Will investment bank will pay to the corporation the net amount of money so the investment bank will pay the corporation the net proceeds and the investment bank will receive from investors the gross amount of money and the difference between the net and the gross camera the difference between the two will be the underwriter's spread. Underwriter's spread. The spread is the difference between, between the, what the underwriter will buy the stock from the issuer and sell it to the investor. It's one of the many spreads that we have in finance. So this is the underwriter's spread and will represent the underwriter's profit. And the profit will involve two elements. One is basic business, they are doing time, effort, advertising. And the second one is the underwriting risk. Let's do underwriting <coughs> risk. The underwriting risk is that the gross profits proceeds will not exceed the net proceeds. In other words, the underwriting risk is that the investment bank will promise $10 of net proceeds to the corporation and when they try to sell the stock at 11, they can't sell it at 11, they can sell it only at 950. So they have to take a loss because they made a 
firm commitment to pay 10 no matter what. So, the underwriter in a firm commitment takes a risk, the risk of not being able to resell the securities as they would expect, and that risk is called underwriting risk. Okay? So, when they make a spread, when they make a profit, the profit will include all the time, all the effort, all the expenses associated with the issue, plus a compensation or return for assuming the underwriting risks. Because they'll do, let's say, 10 issues of securities, and if they do 10 of them, maybe 9 will be successful, and they'll make good profits on it, but maybe one will fail. The one that will fail, the losses will be compensated by the other 9 that will be. So, there will be some return on it. Okay. Now, when stock is issued, when stock is issued on the primary market, it comes in two forms. So, the issue can be for the first time. For the first time means the stock, uh, sorry, uh, the company never issued stock before for public trading. So, the stock is issued for the very first time and it is known as IPO, which means Initial Public Offering. Now, it's very important to understand when the corporation was established for the first time. Uh, okay, camera, camera out there. When the corporation was established, the stock exists. The stock exists when it was established. When we say here initial public offering means the following. That the stock before was private and now it becomes Public. Private means only in a limited number of owners. Maybe only 10, maybe only 20 people. Just a few people will own it. Okay. And if it's sold privately, now camera again, we call it private placement. Private placement is the sale of securities, stocks as well as bond to a small limited number of camera further. You zoom in? Yeah, okay. We call them qualified investors. Qualified investors. Qualified investors are those that are rich, as in wealthy, supposedly these are people with a lot of money, they made a lot of money, they make a lot of investments, they know how to manage money, they understand risk, they understand investing, so they don't in general need the protection of the ordinary people. And the second group of people will be financial institutions, which will be studying hopefully later down the road, maybe three, four weeks down the road, close to the end of the semester, like mutual funds, pension funds, possibly, but not likely, commercial bank, very likely, insurance companies. So, various financial institutions which are considered to be smart, 
sophisticated, usually with a finance degree like all of you. These are people who know what they're doing. So these are the smarter money, the smart money. And then the public will be called, now camera back again, public. Offering. These are the people with not so much education, financial education, not so much financial skills. This is known as the dumb money. People that can be easily fooled, that can be easily tricked, which need a government protection. So private placement is done to qualified investors, as in smart, sophisticated, rich, big money. And public offering is usually made to in ordinary investors, okay, public offering, it means a, that it can be sold to anybody. The buyer is known as the general investor. General investor. And a public offering to the general investor means for sure that the stock will be trading on the secondary market. Which is the same as what is commonly known by everybody, the stock market. So, when we in finance say the stock market, we in finance mean both the primary stock market and the secondary stock market. When uneducated people, common people, journalists, which are typically very dumb, okay, and uneducated, okay, uh, when the news media talk about the stock market, they only mean the secondary stock market. Again, it is very important to understand that it, what people in finance understand is usually very different from what common people understand. So you need to know what they understand and you need to understand that what they understand is fundamentally incorrect or not correct, not right. Usually they have vague ideas about what is what and how it works. Anyway, back to the IPO. IPO means that the stock is being owned only privately and now it will be traded publicly, which means on the secondary stock market for the first time. That's why it's called initial public offering. Yeah, I might as well even write it out. Initial public offering. Is a privately held stock which for the first time is sold to the public and will be publicly traded on the secondary stock market. The alternative is that it's not an initial public offering. It's just a public offering. In this particular case, we say it is seasoned. A seasoned offering is the offer to sell new stock, new shares of a company whose stock already trades on the secondary market. So, if it doesn't trade on the second market and never traded on the second market, it's an IPO. It will become publicly traded on the secondary market, I meaning for the first time. And season means it's already traded. 
In a seasoned offering, the secondary market has a price and gives you a price. So issuing a seasoned offering is very easy. Easy in the sense that the most difficult price, uh, sorry, the most difficult part in issuing a security is getting the price right. Get the price too high and you will not be able to sell a lot. You may suffer an underwriting loss. Get the price too low and you're going to be losing on some money. So setting the stock price is extremely important. And in a season offering, the stock market will set the price for you just right. Okay? It will tell you what the price is. You don't have to worry about the price at all. So that's a seasoned offering. Okay, next, okay, let's move on here. Uh, similar to what we had before, investment bankers, uh, the investment bank responsible for the issue of the stock, the underwriter, we call a lead bank lead bank is the bank which negotiates directly with the issuer on all terms and which is responsible for the whole deal the lead bank is also known as originating bank but back in the old days they would say originating house <clears throat> because in the old days everybody knew and understood that investment bank was not a bank all right it did not accept deposits it didn't make loans so they were not back in the old days called investment banks because they weren't banks at all so they were investment houses okay they know them as a house so it's called originating house originating house is the same as the lead bank and then let me see there's got to be something like uh, participating okay let's do the next thing uh, lead bank and then they have participating bank will be an investment bank which will have only a secondary or supporting role it will be invited by the lead bank on the already established terms and conditions so the lead bank will say well this is what the issue is and these are the terms and these are conditions these are everything else and we have one billion dollars of shares to sell and the participating bank will look at the conditions and say okay we'll take 50 million dollars and they say deal and they participate with 50 million dollars the other 950 will be for the lead bank now all the banks together all the banks together will have form a syndicate known as underwriting syndicate Syndicate is a group of people, like gangsters, or a group of financial institutions, like banksters, okay, who join together to accomplish a common goal, like rob the public, right? In this particular case is issue securities and profit out of it. So, the underwriting syndicate will include only one leading bank, lead bank, and many, two, three, ten, twenty, depending on the size of the issue, 
participating banks or participating or uh, participating banks and may also include a few other brokerages so when the issue size is small the lead bank will take it all and will pocket the profit when the size is large, the issue of the size is large, and the underwriting risk is too large, they will form an underwriting syndicate. And the underwriting syndicate, the main purpose is new people, new expertise, new everything else, is to share or to reduce the underwriting risk. So the lead company may take, let's say, 25% of the whole issue and everybody else will take 5%. So 5%, 5%, 5%, 5% and the lead company will keep 25% for itself. So they will share in the profits and they'll share in the risk, okay? And they'll also, the most important, share in the resources in general sharing customers, sharing contacts, sharing information, and everything else. Let's see what else I got. So, the syndicate, okay. Uh, originating house, going public, okay, public sale, private sale, okay. Next one is preemptive rights. Preemptive right is the right of existing stockholder, those who already own the company, to receive new shares in a new issue proportionately to their ownership so that they can retain their ownership shares. Okay, let's provide a simple, it's complicated, provide a simple example. A uh, company has a total of 1 million shares. Uh, where's number one? And let's say number one owns 100,000 shares because she's way too rich and way too wealthy. That will be you, right? So you have 100,000 shares. But 100,000 shares means that you own 10% of the company. You own 10% of the company. And you control 10% of the company. And you control 10% of the board of directors. And you have other owners. Well, now the company says, we need to, or we want to, issue 200,000 shares. 200,000 shares will dilute, meaning increase the number of shares by 20%. And if you keep your $100,000, uh, sorry, 100,000 shares, now the total is 1.2 million, her share from 10% will go down to about 8%. So if 200,000 shares are sold to other people, your share from 10% control will go down to 8. So, if 200,000 shares are offered, you must be offered first. Before anybody else gets anything, you must be offered 20,000 shares to buy if you want to. To buy if you want to. The preemptive right is a right to buy a proportionate share but not an obligation and she will say yes i will take these twenty thousand shares let's say at fifty dollars if the market price is fifty dollars and she will pay one million dollars and get the twenty thousand shares 
or not, she will say no, thank you, and her 10% share will go down to 8%. She will get, we say, diluted. So the preemptive right is the right of already existing shareholders to receive the same percentage. So if 200,000 shares will be issued, if you have a 10% share, that 20,000 of those new shares will go to you first, if you choose to, if you want to, and if you have the money to pay for, okay? So that's the preemptive right. It is a right that protects those people in control to retain control, okay? It's about control. Let's see. There may be a slightly, a slightly different version called rights offering. And it's usually like this, rights offering. Rights offering is offering to existing stockholders to buy the stock at a slightly reduced price. So the market price is $50, you can buy it at $45. Well, for you, that's kind of like a profit, right? But it's a profit given to everybody else. So all existing shareholders get the right, the offering, to buy it at $45. And then you, as the shareholder, maybe don't have the money to buy new ones, so you will sell the right, $45 right, to somebody else with money, okay? And if she is rich, she will exercise the right and actually purchase the $45 while the market price is $50. So some people would prefer to buy the stock cheaper and hold it and others will prefer to sell the right the right will be worth about about five dollars because the market price is 50 the right price is 45 so you can sell it for almost five dollars to somebody else it's going to be a little less than that so right offering it will be given to the existing of stockholders and they can choose to exercise the right, actually pay money and get the stock, or sell the right to somebody else, to a third party. Let's see what else we got so we can keep moving. All right, well, uh, now I'm going through uh, the process of how you go with the regulator, which is very uh, similar in most countries, but it doesn't have to be exactly the same. So, the first thing you got to do is you need a regulator, regulator approval. In the US it becomes SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission is regulator first, application. before issuing a security to trade publicly, you need to apply with the regulator. It could be the central bank, it could be whatever the financial authority to apply for issuing the security. So it becomes a regulator application. From the application, the regulator will review, you will get a regulator approval. The regulator approval. The regulator will review the application and usually within so many days, maybe 14, maybe 20 days, they'll have to give an approval. How many days depends on the law in the particular country. Let's say in the US maybe 20 days, in the UK maybe 30 days, and in Japan maybe seven days, okay? So they will give an approval or they'll reject and say no for whatever reason. They say we don't like this, we don't like that, this is not good, this is not according to the law. Okay. Then 
you do what is known as the registration statement. Registration statement is an official document which provides information about the business location, the business address, the business owner, the main lines of business, business profitability, or if the business is new, expected business profitability, possibly business competition. In general, the registration statement will give you detailed information about the business which intends to sell securities. In other words, detailed information about the issuer. Any investor should be able to see the registration statement. It is made with the regulator and is legally binding. If there is any information that is incorrect or wrong, people can go to jail in countries where the legal system operates uh, well. In corrupt countries, rich people don't go to jail, right? They buy their way out of jail. So, the registration statement is going to also give you uh, expected or what will be the risks of the business. So, they'll outline the major risks of the business for iPhone will be that Samsung may be coming with a better toy and cheaper one, okay? Or maybe that there is a security issue with the iPhone which the government can exploit and customers will say, well, we don't want to use iPhone anymore because the government's going to track our conversation messages. So, it will provide the risk and it will provide a background on the managers. It will provide who these people are, if they run businesses before, what kind of experience they have. In other words, what's the business model and the people that will run it. The next thing, based on the registration, is called the red herring. Let me see where it's my thing, so it's up a little bit. Red herring. A red herring prospectus is a shorter marketing version of the registration statement which is used to advertise the issue to potential investors. So, if you're all investors in the room, there will be a red herring prospectus. It's a nice little brochure. tells you, this is our company, this is what we do, this is who we are, this is how we think we're going to make a lot of profit, and this is how we think we're going to make you rich. Okay, we have this very special medicine that will regrow your hair again, and we can get that uh, medicine uh, working. We have 1 billion bald men and maybe uh, you know, 200 million bolder women that will benefit from it. We can sell it maybe for 50 or 100 dollars a person and we could make whatever so many, let's say 100 billion dollars of profit. And with so many shares we could make whatever. So the red herring will describe in nice attractive ways how profitable the business might be, but without misrepresenting significantly, because for misrepresenting information, they can go to jail. Okay, so that's the red herring. It's given to, okay, it's a preliminary version of the prospectus. It's only a preliminary, it's only an initial version, okay? It's not the final version. The final version becomes final when the regulator 
uh, uh, approves the application. When the regulator approves the application, then it becomes the final version. But the regulator may say, oh, no, you need to change this, this, this doesn't look right, this doesn't look whatever. Then you have to make the changes, and then you have to change the red herring prospectus or the final prospectus. The final one is just called the official. prospectus or the final prospectus. This is what has been already approved by the regulator and this is what can be used to investors to actually sell. So the first one, the red herring just gives you a good idea. Say, hey, we're going to be having next month, maybe week three, maybe week four, we're going to be offering stock uh, uh, for the company that will cure cancer or baldness or short-sightedness or whatever diseases that could be phenomenally profitable. And the official one is what the government actually approved. There may be minor differences, there may be major differences. One difference will be for sure the red herring will not give a price and the official prospectus will usually give the price. And the official prospectus could literally be done the day before the issue. But everybody else will already have an excellent idea of what the offer will be. And when the official uh, prospectus comes, all they want to know, are there any changes? And the big question, what's the price? Because the price is the most important thing. Okay, let's see. There may be what is called, finally, this is strictly the United States, but it seems that other countries begin to adopt it. It's called shelf registration. Shelf registration in this particular case is not a financial innovation, it's a legal regulatory innovation where once the, the stock issue has been approved, for example, they approve 2 million shares to be sold, the approval is to last for, let's say, a year or to last for two years, to last for a long period of time and let's say you have a shelf registration for 2 billion shares. Then you can choose and sell 100,000 shares. And maybe after three months you can choose and sell half a million shares. And you can sell 50,000 shares or 1 million shares. So shelf registration provides two extremely important advantages for major corporations. Number one, it provides flexibility. Flexibility, let's say in the following sense. You're going to be building a big hotel, and the big hotel is going to take three years to build. You can issue stock now for the whole hotel, okay? And you will have to keep the cash in the bank or invest it in bonds and other stuff. Or you can, let's say, have 2 million shares and you will issue only, let's say, half a million of those 2 million for the first year. When you run out of money, you will sell another half a million. So flexibility means you will sell as many shares whenever you need. That's very important. So you don't have to issue too many shares. You need only, let's say, one million dollars, you're going to sell so many shares at that price. So flexibility is very important. And the second one with shelf registration, very important advantage, is speed. When you make an initial application, up to the approval can take 20 days. 
but it can take up to two months. The regulator can come back and say, fix this, fix that, provide this information, provide that information, where is this coming? You know, they can, they can drag things on for 20 days to two months. Here, once it's been approved, when you want to issue, you only notify. We will issue 100,000 shares, so it can take one or two days. And the speed also allows to choose a very good timing when to sell. So stock goes up, market is good, everybody feels good, now is a good time to issue. It takes one or two days. Now, if you try to do a regular registration, within 30 days, the stock market may have crashed, there may be problems with everything else, and the whole thing may fail, and now the stock is 50, within a month it may be already 30. So it might not be worth issuing the stock. Alright, let's see what's next. Uh, well, that's it. Take a five minute break and we continue. <laughs>